is from the prophet Habakkuk, the third chapter, beginning to the seventeenth verse. And the prophet writes the following. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the, like the deer's. He makes me tread on the high places. Here ends the reading of the first lesson. The second lesson is from St. Paul's letter to the Galatians, the fifth chapter, beginning with the 22nd verse. And the Apostle Paul writes the following by the Holy Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. Here is the reading of the second lesson. And I invite you to please rise from the reading of the gospel. And the gospel is from the gospel of St. Matthew, the fifth chapter. <coughs> Verses 10 through 12. And the Apostle Matthew writes the following on the Holy Spirit. Our Lord Jesus is speaking and he says this. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you. And utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The gospel of our Lord, you may be seen. So, Father, I want to thank you for this time together. Thank you that you have brought your Son into our presence, for he, is, he has said that wherever two or three are gathered in his name, there he is amidst of them. So we welcome you, Lord Jesus. We praise and honor and glorify you, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, our strength, our rock, our redeemer. Lord, you are the shepherd of the sheep, and we know our need of you. So we want you to lead us today. We submit to you. Lead us, Lord, direct our thoughts, direct our hearts. Lord, cleanse us where we need cleanse us. Healing where we need healing. Deliver us where we need delivered. And direct us where we need direction. And feed us on your word this morning. We ask that by your Holy Spirit that whatever uh, is of sin or temptation or the flesh or the devil would fall to the ground and die and be of no effect so that we would receive, Lord, all that you have for us. And let the word of my mouth and meditation of our hearts be truly acceptable in your sight, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, during these Sundays, we are talking about the fruit of the Spirit that we find written in Galatians chapter 5. And the last two Sundays we've talked about love 
And we were reminded that love is directed in two ways. Is it sacrificial love where we surrender our will to God and we submit to Him and to His will and to His word that we live for Him and not for ourselves? And then love is also directed toward our neighbor so that we step out of our comfort zones. And not only do we meet the physical needs of our neighbors, but most importantly, we speak to them of their need of salvation and repentance and coming to the Lord. So we talked about love, the fruit, the last two Sundays. Today, we are going to go to the next fruit found on that list of nine, and that is joy. And as we talk about the fruit called joy, we need to answer three questions. First, what is joy? Secondly, why do we need it? And third, where or in what is your joy rooted? So we'll deal with those three questions. The first question is, what is joy? And the reason that's an important question for us to answer is because very often when we think of joy, we tend to think of our emotions. How are we feeling today? Are we feeling good? Are we feeling happy? Is everything all right with us? And if everything's all right with us and we're feeling happy, then we, we claim to have joy. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. And in fact, it's good that when things are good, that we rejoice in the Lord and we show gratitude in that way. But in the Bible, joy is not rooted in the emotions. There may be an emotional response, but it's not rooted in the emotions. And you know why that's important? Because you might feel good today, but that doesn't mean in five seconds you'll feel good. Or in five hours. Will you agree with me that things change rather rapidly? You might think news that all of a sudden you're like, oh, I can't believe that. And if our joy is simply an emotion, then it does not have the power to hold us, to confirm us, to strengthen us, and to establish us so that we don't fall into the depression of the Spirit. Joy must not be rooted in emotions. So what is joy then biblically? Well, joy biblically is delighting in God. And it's delighting in God with the confidence that no matter what we experience, whether it's good or bad, we can expect that God is faithful and He is going to act on our behalf in this life and the next. In other words, joy in the Bible is rooted in something stronger, more lasting, eternal, than our emotions. Joy, biblically, is rooted in three things that go together. First of all, joy is rooted in a personal, intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, for the Christian, for the born-again Christian, Jesus is not simply an idea. He's not simply a theory. He's not simply a historical figure that we agree existed long ago. He is not some, some guess and hope that maybe he's alive and well and he'll help us. No. For a Christian, they have met the Lord. They know that he is alive. They know that his promises are true. They know that they know that they know that He is their rock and their salvation because they know Him. They have become intimate with Him. And that makes all the difference. You know, I remember uh, somebody saying to me, well, how do you know all this is true? And I was like, well, I know it's true because I'm in it. I can't deny Him any more than I can deny that I, I know my wife. I know her because I see her all the time. We eat together. I'm in a relationship with her. It's the same with him. I know her. 
And what we need to understand is that it makes all the difference in the world. You know, in Romans 5, the Apostle Paul says these words. He says, not only this, but we rejoice in our sufferings. That's joy. We rejoice in our suffering. Know that suffering produces endurance, endurance character, and character hope, which is, which is the sure and certain expectation of good. And our hope does not disappoint us. Why? Because the love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Think about that. The reason that we can meet suffering and rejoice and know that everything's going to be all right, that's going to be for our good. The reason we can do this is not because we love to suffer. That would be sick. I mean, if you really like to suffer, there's something wrong with you. But we can rejoice in it because we know who? We know Jesus. God has poured in His love, His love for us by the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. And when we have the Holy Spirit, guess who else we've met? Jesus and the Father. We know Him. That's the rock upon which our joy is built. And if we know Him, then we also know two other things. We also know that He doesn't lie. That's faith. We have faith because we know that our God doesn't lie to us. His promises are sure and certain. And we can count on that. But not only that, we have, we have hope. Hope is the short and certain expectation of good that no matter what happens, God will never leave us or forsake us and we have good awaiting us both in this life and in the next. That's what joy Real joy is gravity. And by the way, that's why we need joy. You know why we need joy to answer the second question? We need joy because that joy is what's going to see us through when bad times come. That knowing Jesus that faith and hope, that joy will see us through. And not just see us through, but give us victory even in the midst of great suffering and persecution. You know, when Habakkuk, in today's first lesson, looked out on Israel, he had this vision where he saw Israel completely, totally annihilated, destroyed, exiled. There's no more food. There's no more cities. The economy is shot. There's absolute nothing. Just darkness. But he says these words. No, I see these things, yet I will rejoice in my God. I will take joy in the rock of my salvation. Because he knew his God. Because he knew that God was faithful. Because he knew that, that even though there is this darkness, God is not done. And he will vindicate his people. He was able to have joy and not despair. See, God will joy doesn't mean that you're not upset with the evil that happens. It doesn't mean you won't even shed a tear. You will. But you're not going to despair. You're not going to have depression. You're not going to give up. You know, give up is not in the Christian's vocabulary. Surrender to God is. But not give up. You know why? God will listen to Because we know our Lord. We know His faith. We know that all things work together with good. For those who love God and call according to his purposes. 
That joy is what gave Silas and Paul the ability in Philippi when they were in a dungeon and beaten up and isolated and in the dark. It gave them the ability to praise and worship the Lord and give Him the glory in the deepest, darkest dungeon of the place so that everybody was listening and then God brought a great miracle. Joy. Joy of the Spirit is always touching on Christ. Is always touching on that relationship and on who He is and what He has done and what He will do and accomplish. That joy is absolutely essential for us to have. If we are to meet the darkness that's coming because how many of you know that it's getting darker? It is. Things are not going to automatically get better just because we go to the voting booth. It's not. Things have been going in decline for some time, no matter who we vote for. Because it's an issue of human character, not an issue of parties. And what we need to understand is that if we're going to meet that time of joy with confidence, with assurance, with victory, that we have to have this joy of the Spirit. Grounded in knowing Jesus and having faith in Him and having our hope firmly focused on Him. But now that means to one other thing, one other question. Where is your joy grounded? In what is your joy rooted? Is it in the relationship that you have with Jesus? Or is, is it in your emotions? And you know what will show you where it's rooted? You won't see it when things are good. But you will see it when the testing comes and things are hard. Because that's the test of that joy. Is your joy and my joy grounded in our emotions and how we feel in the moment that things are going to bring or is our joy rooted in that relationship with Jesus? Because when these hard times come, and we all experience hard times, but when we, when we have to experience them, and we will over and over again, if we can stand with confidence that we know that all things work together for good, with confidence that we know that Jesus is with us. With confidence that we know that He is faithful. And confidence that we know that we have the expectation of good now and for all eternity. Then our joy, our rejoicing, will be founded on the rock. It will stand. And we'll have victory even in the times of trial. But if we find that our joy is based on how we're feeling at the moment, well, that's good to know. You know why it's good to know? It's good to know because then we can say, you know what? I have my focus on the wrong thing. It's good to get back to God, but things are good. But Jesus says, in Matthew 5, you know, blessed are you when men revile you. Speak all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. By the way, when people are talking about you in a bad way, spreading evil rumors, uh, you know, telling people that, that, that you're nothing, that, that, that you're worthless, you know, etc., etc., etc. Does that in the natural seem like the right time to rejoice? 
And guess what? You surely can. You know why you can? He said, because your reward is great now. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And that's our Lord Jesus saying, your joy is not based on what happens to you or how people treat you or the outward circumstances that you can't control. Your joy must be in Christ, who is the lover of your soul, and on the promises that He has. So if you find that your joy is in your emotions, it's time to refocus. Focus on the relationship with Jesus. You love Him. Rejoice in Him. Rejoice in His name. Rejoice that He will never leave you for sin. Rejoice that you can always expect good from Him. And this will give you the solid ground to meet the hard times that must come in our lives anyway as long as we're living on planet Earth. But especially the hard times that are coming in these last of the last days. Now next week, we'll talk about the fruit called peace. Let's pray. So, Father, I want to thank you. Thank you that you have given us through your Son, by the infilling of your Holy Spirit, a great foundation for joy that will not change. Lord, forgive us when we have placed our joy on how we're feeling instead of our relationship with you. And Lord, we commit ourselves to focus on you more and more so that our joy will be complete and so that we can share that joy with others. In Jesus' name, amen.